So yeah, I'm going to continue the theme of mapping alteration around ICG deposits with uh, more of a regional um, flavour to it. And I think what I'm going to present is very complementary to, to what Cathy's just presented. So there's three main points I want you to get out of this talk, and that is that um, sodium can, and potassium alteration provides the, the broadest um, alteration of footprint around ICGs, and that there are distinct trends in the eastern Gaul that demonstrate uh, a range of crustal depths. That um, obviously magnetics and gravity are, uh, are key data sets for mapping alteration in ICG systems. But I also want to underline the importance of magnetics in particular um, in terms of its ability to map the roots of an ICG system and um, provide an understanding of fluid pathways. And lastly, that trace element geochemistry um, can be used to map footprints and vector in ICG systems. So the basis to my um, talk is really the um, reassaying of existing holes held in the core library, or GSSA um, storage, um, uh, reassaying and high logging, hyperspectral logging of, of over 300 holes now um, um, along the eastern Gawler. So over the, the several years that we've been sampling, we're up to over 2,700 individual metre samples from 112 holes in the region. So full multi-element suite and petrophysics for most of those samples. Okay, so uh, over the years, I suppose any um, mineralisation that uh, has a bit of iron oxide associated with it has been thrown into the, the ICG deposit class at some stage. And that's particularly an issue in, in South Australia where we want everything to be an ICG. Now, the, the issue with that is it's led to a bit of a uh, loose um, classification that has led to a confusion on the genetic model for ICGs, but also understanding of the alteration. But um, perhaps it's, it's not as confusing as it can first look. So this is a, a simplified version of a, a fantastic um, model presented in Korovu um, et al, and I recommend people have a look at that. And they're basically um, uh, got a, a simple explanation of why you would see an array of um, deposits in an ICG um, overall system within the class. So they're basically saying that the main control is, um, is temperature and distance from the source. Um, and it's basically a fluid evolution um, up as it cools and up through the crust. And so you go from high temperature alteration, so the, um, uh, you have early um, albertization, um, you move through um, various different um, alteration um, assemblages written up there in um, alteration facies, and these relate to the different um, variations of, of ICGs that we see. So it actually beautifully explains um, everything we see in the Eastern Gawler, although I think their model lacks a little bit of um, the influence of the secondary fluid that we know exists. Um, it, it does explain everything that we see, and interestingly, at the top of the model there, um, epithermal systems are predicted, widespread silicification. So what are the, um, the implications of um, this kind of model? evolving fluid model. Well, firstly, um, if we, we, can there, we can map the, the distribution of sodic alteration and potassium alteration, we're going to differentiate between that, um, the uh, you know, lower part of the system and this um, developed to the, the upper part of the system, the lower temperature part of the system. So what does it look like in the eastern Gawler? So what I've done here is um, so where um, samples have approximately si or similar um, albite to k felsfer ratio, I've, I've called that um, background, and that's in um, the pale yellow, where it's got far more potassium um, felsfer in it, I've called it a potassium alteration, and, and where it's a lot more um, albite in, in the sample, um, called sodic alteration. So what are some of the trends that we, we see? 
So in both Mount Woods and York Peninsula, um, we see a dominance of albitic alteration, although there's local zones of K-felspar alteration. And then in the central um, eastern Gawler, there's a predominance for potassic alteration. So, um, you know, higher up in the system is, is really where we're at there. Rather interestingly, at this kind of scale, um, uh, east and northeast of um, OD, we also see um, a lot of um, sodic alteration preserved, with the inference being that's a deeper crustal um, level um, we're seeing through there, and that's pretty consistent with some of the rocks that we see through there. So that's a, a really broad brush approach to looking at those trends, but what we've got with the Highlogger is an amazing resource in terms of being able to um, quantify and map the um, feldspar alteration. So now that we have the thermal, we can look at feldspars, um, and this records um, alteration um, at the metre scale, actually centimetre scale. Um, so let's just have a bit of a closer look. What I've got there is mineral summaries um, from um, some holes from those different regions. So down hole is from left to, to right. Um, at the top, um, so brown is, is albite and, and orange is, is K feldspar. So Manxman um, uh, prospect up in Mount Woods, dominated by albite alteration. The Titan prospect, dominated by albite alteration. Um, Emmy Bluff in the central eastern Gawler, um, a lot of the feldspar has been destroyed there, but we do see it dominated by K feldspar. The um, Panati Lagoon or Emmy Bluff kind of region, um, sorry, the Punt Hill kind of region, um, so Scarn systems, they're, they're actually dominated by K feldspar as well. Um, you know, they're consistent with, the, with that um, upper level um, SCARN system development there. And then near Alfred West, um, dominated by albite alteration. So this is it's giving the real um, detailed description of the alteration of, of, of those differences between feldspars. It tells us about the crustal depths through this region. So in terms of the spectral data, um, gives a very powerful tool for mapping alteration. Um, but one of the you know, painful things about using spectral or hologger data has always been that y you really want to look at it in TSG, and if you don't do that, it's, it's always been a bit of a pain. So in the last couple of years, Simon van der Willen has been working to try to put that all into the one um, spreadsheet. So that data is now available, um, and it's, it's on your USB sticks. It's all the hologger data um, as of last year um, into the one spreadsheet um, and what that has is um, all the holes, metre intervals and, um, and the amount of um, minerals. Um, so lots of columns. I've highlighted in there yellow just to give you an example. So from 426 metres to 427, about 24% carbonate in there. So that's what you're, you're going to get in that spreadsheet and you can play with it and, and use it however you want. So back to the Korovu model. Um, another one of the implications is that um, early stages of alteration are crucial to uh, ground preparation. And this is a really important point in ISCG systems, that evolution of the alteration, early um, alteration um, has to have happened. Um, and it's important ground preparation to form a, a decent kind of deposit. Um, the inference is, is that all ICGs are going to have a magnetic response, and that, that means that uh, magnetics is ideal for uh, ideal mapping tool. So quickly looking at some examples, OD, it's, is, it's a very easy um, one to pick out because um, it's in Roxby Downs Granite. Um, the, the mag and gravity pick out OD very easily. Um, but it's not always that easy. So the Emmy Bluff Intercept Hill region, the, the gravity response is a bit more complicated. The geology is a bit more diverse through there. There's multiple explanations for gravity highs. But if we look at the mag, um, we'll see, you can see that um, each of the mineralized centers that I've arrowed to are actually um, um, relate to a, a mag anomaly. And um, in particular, along the east, there's a um, linear kind of mag response. Um, and I think this is actually 
mapping a, um, um, a, 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 well, a structure that's probably the source of um, the, the magmatic fluids or hydrothermal fluids and, and therefore the root of um, the um, ICG mineralization that we see in this region. So another quick example, um, SCARN systems in, in the Punt Hill kind of region of arid to the, the Groundhog prospect there. Um, thing to note is in Groundhog and the SCARN system, there's no magnetite at all in the mineralization, yet there is a um, residual uh, mag response. So if I zoom in through there, you'll see the drill holes are around where there's most significant mineralization, um, and clearly there's a, a relationship there. So we've done an inversion model um, uh, of the magnetics and shown that the mag is actually, um, the response is sitting below that, and there's actually a bit of a connection from much larger um, mag response to the, um, to the west, um, and suggesting that it's, it's mapping um, fluid pathways. So the take home message from that is that magnetics and gravity data are critical um, in mapping alteration in ICG systems. Um, and that um, the MAG really provides an understanding of fluid pathways and regions that have seen the early or high temperature um, part of the system. So we've had looked at sodic and potassic alteration. Um, these give really broad trends. Uh, magnetics and gravity narrow down that search space, but I suppose the challenge has always been um, to determine whether you've got a significant system or not. Now, I don't think I necessarily have the answer for that, but I'm pretty sure that um, I, th I think that um, trace element geochemistry can help. So, Cathy talked about um, this paper, and this is another great paper to have a, have a look at. Um, basically, my take on it, the summary is that um, as you alter your feldspars in these systems early on, evolving system, um, you form porosity, um, you get lots of inclusions. Those inclusions are the things that, that host trace elements and is the start of forming um, footprints um, or halos around these systems. So lots of various, you know, there's lots of potential um, minerals that can fill those inclusions. Pyrite is one of those um, minerals and we know pyrite um, hosts a lot of trace elements. It just steamed, um, is up next. Great talk on, on looking at pyrite chemistry in these systems. Um, and that's part of a collaboration with um, CODES and, and GSSA looking at um, um, footprints and, and, and mineral chemistry in this neck of the woods. So, but basically, if you get widespread alteration, it means that you're forming, gonna form large footprints that we can see in the trace element chemistry. So what I've done is, is by integrating the, the geochemistry and the, um, and the spectral the alteration, being able to come out with um, elements that are associated with mineralized zones. And what I've shown up there is um, elements associated with hematite dominated systems and elements associated with magnetite dominated systems. Now, what's really interesting is that the magnetite dominated systems lack a strong association with arsenic, silver, bismuth, antimony, and, and tungsten. And certainly with those first four, these are elements that you associate with lower temperature um, hydrothermal systems. So if we look, um, antimony as an example, um, is uh, plotted on all the holes that have been sampled in the Eastern Gawler perspective view here. Um, Antimony highlights the central um, eastern Gawler where we know it's upper level um, alteration. Um, other than that, you, you tend to see it um, associated with the, the deposits. But you can look at elements that are associated with the high temperature and, 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 um, and proximal to the actual um, center of the ICG system, such as cerium. And what this does is, is actually pinpoint where we see all the known deposits and um, the most significant intersections. So this is providing a vector. So just note that you get a lot of mid-tones there just because of the fact that um, the, the GRV is elevated above crustal abundance in, in cerium. Um, so I use a 
uh, as a threshold 10 times cross to abundance. So a very quick um, uh, little case study, um, just um, showing this at deposit scale, so back to that Emmy Bluff or Intercept Hill um, region. So one of the issues here, got widespread copper um, uh, anomalism in the drill hole, so those sticks there are coloured by copper um, on each sample, so they're down hole um, samples in each of those holes corresponding to that tr um, traverse. Um, and so copper um, is high in, in most holes, and, and in particular I had three there, is um, particularly, you know, pretty interesting. If you look at the low temperature um, kind of elements, so let's, let's say a typical one would be antimony, um, I had three lights up again, um, uh, I had five, which is actually the main mineralised hole we know of right now, um, also has some high values. Um, however, if we look at cerium, it tells a completely different story. And I really like this. Um, so what it's actually showing is you get much higher values in I had um, two to the east. So what this is potentially um, showing you is that there's a greater proportion of hydrothermal fluids um, to the east. And this provides a fantastic link to that um, mag anomaly and the idea that that's actually the source of, of the high temperature fluids or root of the um, uh, an ICG system. So just in conclusion, um, the, the sodic and potassium alteration trends demonstrate a range of crustal depths in the eastern Gawler and is therefore um, uh, and, and therefore gives you the kind of styles of ICGs that you should be looking for in those regions. Um, magnetic data map the roots of ICG systems and provide an understanding of fluid pathways. And lastly, that um, trace element geochemistry can be used to vector in ICG systems with um, certain elements potentially indicating the source of low temperature fluids and the source of the high temperature fluids. So helping map and understand the actual system. Thank you.